Hi, I'm Mark Ward, editor of Bible Study Magazine. The final issue of the magazine, Out Today, has a cover story that I wrote on a topic that is very important to me personally and very important to Jesus. It's love. I invested several years of my life a couple years ago writing a book on this very topic, mining the example and the language of the Apostle Paul to discover the Bible's teaching on love. I found that a great number of my fellow Christians were talking about love in a way that I came to feel needed correction. In particular, they were focused on the Greek word agape, one of the few New Testament Greek words that most many Christians seem to know. They had developed, however, an elaborate set of meanings for this simple Greek word, agape, that I found in my research just did not fit the usage of the word agape in the Bible and did not match the Bible's actual teaching in sentences on love. One of the best theological guides that I discovered in my research when it came to love was actually Jonathan Lehman of Nine Marks Ministries. His interest is in the church in ecclesiology, but in his book, The Church and the Surprising Offense of God's Love, I found a depth of biblical insight that was superior to countless other things that I'd read on this topic of love. I decided to put Jonathan on the cover of the final Bible study magazine, and I actually got to interview him about love in the church library in the basement at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. The insights came thick and fast, as I think you'll see in the interview, and it's my delight now to share this interview with you. How do you serve the body of Christ? Uh, I'm Jonathan Lehman. I am editorial director for Nine Marks, which is a ministry to other churches. I serve as an elder at Chevrolet Baptist Church. I'm married to a wonderful woman and have four glorious daughters. Why did you write two books on love? So I wrote this book, The Church and the Surprising Offense of God's Love, a real small, reintroducing the doctrines of church membership and discipline. I wrote it to talk about membership and discipline in churches, which is something that's been lost. But to talk about those things, I realized we need to talk about love, God's love, and the holiness of God's love. So though I set out to talk about church membership and discipline, and I ended up writing a book about love, God's love, this, the the first book I wrote, The Church and the Surprising Offense of God's Love, is beefy and helpful, but some people, I don't know why, wanted shorter books. So I wrote a shorter version of this book in The Rule of Love, how the local church should reflect God's love and authority as a, as a shorter, hopefully a little easier to read book to the, to the first one I did, explaining uh, the idea of what God's love is like and how churches should in fact reflect and display the glory of God's love and God's holy love. In your book, you make the beginning of an argument that I've heard a thousand times, but you finish it differently. You say that the world defines love a certain way, but we need to define it biblically. And what I usually hear Bible teachers go on to say after that is something about agape, how that Greek word means gift love, and eros means a acquisitive love. Why didn't you do that? Yeah, great question. Three reasons, uh, a textual reason, a theological reason, and a pastoral reason. Textually, you have words in the New Testament like agape and phileo used interchangeably, such that it's hard to really build your answer of what love is just on this word as if this word is always being used in this way. So, you know, you think of Jesus and Peter in John 21, where he says, Peter, do you love me? Agape me? And Peter says, yeah, I love phileo you, right? And then in the third time he asks, Jesus switches from agape to phileo. Peter, do you phileo me? Okay, so the words are being used interchangeably. It's hard to build an entire theology on just the way a word is used in one uh, specific context. We have the textual reason. Theologically, I just don't think that's how love works, right? I think love almost always involves, and we can talk more about this, love almost always involves both a desire for something as well as often, not always, but often uh, a desire to give something or to do good to someone, right? And the way among theological conversation it often goes is agape becomes this kind of selfless gift love, whereas eros is often treated as this desire filling up what's lacking in me love, and then phileo is something kind of in between, or you know, maybe it's friendship love or something like that. But the, but the problem is this idea of love that's either pure gift or pure take, desire, fill up what's lacking because you're beautiful or that ice cream looks good and I want it, I love it, right? It's just that's not quite how love works. 
you know, you think of uh, the, the father saying to the son, you are my beloved son, my agapetos son, with whom I'm well pleased. Well, the father's well pleased. He's looking at the son. He's well pleased. He takes pleasure in the son. I love you, my beloved son. So he's going to give to the son, but he's also taking pleasure in it. There's both agapetos and eros, at least as it's kind of sometimes defined, right? Okay, so, so first textually, it just doesn't work that way. Second, theologically, love is, is bigger, more complicated than those, those, those typical ways of defining them. And then third, pastorally, I would say that when we have a concept of pure love as gift— and we lose all desire, all pleasure in that, we end up with, and again, we can double-click on this, at least as we used to say, <laughs> double-click. Uh, we end up with something that looks like theological liberalism. Pastorally, in my discipleship, if love is entirely, I'm just giving to you, and I'm putting absolutely nothing on you, requiring nothing of, of you, well, that leads to a kind of easy believism. That leads to a, Jesus is Savior but not Lord view of the Christian life. And, uh, well, that's problematic for all sorts of reasons. You define love tentatively as an affection for another's good. But you fill this out a little. I'm going to quote you. Something in you attracts me to your good. Furthermore, the good that I want for you has a fixed and a certain content to it. God. God is the good that God lovingly wants for others, and he's the good that we should lovingly want for others. What do you, Dr. Lehman, make of the fact that when the Bible talks about love, it's willing to use the word love and the Hebrew and Greek words for love, ahav and agape, in speaking of sinful love. So Amnon loved his sister Tamar. And the Pharisees loved the chief seats at the feast. And it's possible, 1 John 2.15, to love the world and the things that are in the world. Yeah, a couple of things. Number one, it reminds us that we need to divide our, our linguistic evaluation and our exegesis from our theology, right? So, yeah, love, and I say agape love, or as that word is used, is, is, is used for bad things. In other words, I, I don't want to, and here's, and here's here's the point, I don't want to build my entire theology on a word and a certain definition of a word that I'm, I'm giving to it. Rather, when I build my theology and my, my doctrinal definition of love, and that's what I try to do in the, in, when you read from me, I'm trying to build a theological or a doctrinal definition of love, I want to look at all the uses of a word, like agape, but I also want to look at other words for love, like you know, eros or phileo and so forth, and see how all of those, and together, I'm trying to put them together and, and ask the question, okay, what is true love or biblical love or let's say godly love? Now, we understand, or Augustine made the point, that there's two kinds of love, right? There's, there's two domains, love that's centered on God and love that's centered on self, right, in some form or fashion. And all of, all of creation, all humanity is divided, said Augustine, between love of God and love of self. And we know that in our own hearts, right? Even if we're Christians, we know that we, we can tend towards love of God and we can tend towards love of self in all of our actions. And so what the text is doing in those uh, specific instances is giving us selfish love, right? We still want to go back and say, okay, what should love be? And love should always be centered on God. God's own love is always centered on God. The Father's love for the Son by definition, is centered on God because the, the Son is God, right? And, and the Son's love for the Father and the Father's love for the Spirit and the Spirit's love for Father and Son. They're all God-centered. In the, in the triune community, right, of Father, Son, and, and, and Spirit, God's love for the other is always centered on God. There, there, there's a giving and a receiving that merge in the intertertertarian love of God, and that's beautiful. And then humanity, when, when he loves humanity, does he leave his godness behind or his, his centeredness on God? No, he doesn't do that. He, he, he draws us into his very love for himself. So he says to the Father, or Jesus says to the Father in the high priestly prayer in John 17, Father, would you love them even as you have loved me? Right, so we're drawn into that community, or that's probably not the best word. We're drawn into that, that, that swirl of divine love, Father for the Son, Son for the Father, Spirit, and, and we're, we become a part of that. So our love, insofar as it's right, needs to remain God-centered.
You wrote, God loves everyone because God beholds his own handiwork, his image and glory in everyone. God's love is God-centered. So, does God love me as me? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. He loves you as you, but because he created you and everything you have is from him. Now, this is a tough one for us, all right, and our fallen selves. But let's just stop and think about the basics of creation. So there's, a, there's dirt. God picks up the dirt. He fashions it. Ah, it's Adam, or all of us, right? Fashioned out of clay, here we are. Now, is there anything in us, intrinsic to us, that's valuable, lovable, beautiful, wonderful, special, worthy, apart from what God has given to it or given to us? Like, are, are we bringing anything to this relationship between us and God that he didn't actually bring? Like, what am I contributing here, right? I'm showing up with my, my you know, few cents, my nickels, whatever. Where did I get that? Everything that I have, if he is the creator and I am the creature, everything I have is necessarily from God. So when God looks on creation and says, behold, it is good, and then on the seventh day he says, behold, it is very good, is he looking at something that creation brought to the conversation apart from him? Or is he, in fact, look, I just built this tree house. Ooh, look, this tree house I made for my kids. That's really cool. I built this birdhouse for me and my daughter. I baked this cake. Oh, it's cool. I mean, is the cake bringing something? It's like, no, I baked this cake, and that's good. So when God looks at you in creation and says, I love you, in a sense, it's his own glory as manifest in you that he loves. But here's the deal. He's made you in his own image. You are your own self-conscious, independent, not attached to him in this kind of, you know, everything is connected to the force. Not that. We're all swirling together as the force, you know, Luke Skywalker, not, not that, but actually independent from God, creator, creature, but creature in God's image. Yes, independently, that is something that he now loves. But again, everything he's given you is from him. So he loves that which is good and beautiful from him, right? You, you got to hold both. I'm independent from God. I'm a creature, not the force. But, so he loves me, but everything that is me, that's good and beautiful is from him. The creator, right? Which is to say, as Augustine put it, God always, or we're always to love one another with respect to God. And God loves us with respect to God, right? So God's, God's love in that sense always remains God-centered. And as soon as the creature starts to say, hey, you know, I'm going to bring my own stuff to this that I didn't get from you. I know you said, God, that don't eat from this tree. But, you know, I know better. I want to be like God, knowing, you, know, you might say, defining good from evil. Well, at that point, we become sinful. At that point, we, become, we, be, we begin to choose that which is not God. At that point, we say, I'm wiser than God. I'm more beautiful than God. I can bring something to God that is beautiful in and of itself, not from God. Well, that's sin. That's death. That, that's a bad path. Did you create the universe? Do you know how everything works? Are you the designer of everything? Do you really think you can bring something beautiful? Think of Romans 11, for, for, uh, for from him and through him and to him are all things, all love, all beauty, all goodness, all righteousness, from him, through him, to him. So yes, the, the universe is fundamentally God-centered. It's wired and designed to be God-centered. True love is God-centered. So when God looks at you and he says, I love you, what is that? Well, that is, on the one hand, his enjoyment of his own beauty in the creation of you. And number two, what is that? It's a picture of his generosity. I want you to enjoy all the beauty, all the glory. That is me. Think of love now finally in redemption. What is, what is redemption? Again, it's God saying, you don't deserve this. You've been sinful, but I want to give you everything. Think, think, of, a, think of a bride standing next to her new husband, wedding day, father, rich man. He, he, he says to the bride, look around, look, look at this mansion. Look at, look at my antique car garage. Look at the vineyards. Look at the orchard. Look at the servants running around to provide you and your husband everything. I want to give all of this to you, he says to the bride. 
right? And picture for a moment that bride, let's suppose she's not exactly been a nice bride. Let's suppose she's even kind of offended the father. She's, she's, she's been unkind and rude to him in various ways. And still there on the wedding day, the father says to the bride, all of this is yours. And I'm going to love you even as I love my own son. I'm going to give the love I have for my son to you, bride, right? And it's all yours. So does he love the bride? Yes. But what he loves in the bride is the beauty and the glory that is from him, right? And it's now hers and she gets to share in it. If I say as a Bible teacher and as I've heard countless Bible teachers say that agape love is unconditional love, what could possibly be wrong with such a commonplace theological statement? Okay, this, this, this is a tough one. We have to, we have to unpack a, a few things here, right, to, to get at that. Now, on the one hand, when people talk about Christian love being unconditional, they're, they're saying true and good things, right? So I, I'm not a can, on a campaign here against the word. I, I want to affirm what's good in the idea of love being, quote, unquote, unconditional. And that's the idea that God loves us in spite of our sins. A slightly better word, I think, is contrary, contra-conditional. I get that from David Pallison. Contrary to what we deserve, God loves us. That is a beautiful, glorious thing. It's the hope of our salvation. I've sinned, and yet in spite of my sin, I've deserved, I've earned God's wrath, and in spite of that, God loves me anyway. I think that's what people are talking about principally when they talk about unconditional love. The danger, so I want to affirm all of that, uh, the danger uh, of it is that it presumes that we were saved apart from conditions. We weren't. Conditions were met. Somebody had to meet the conditions. Think of Psalm 45 uh, about this messianic king who had come, which Hebrews 1 then picks up and says this is about Jesus. Psalm 45, Hebrews 1 says, the father says to the son, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness, therefore I anoint you with oil above your companions. The Son met the conditions. You and I have salvation only because the Son met the conditions. God is not unjust in loving us. God is just in loving us. Something had to satisfy the conditions. The Lord Jesus Christ did that. So when the Father says to the Son, you are my Son with you, whom I am well pleased, why is the Father well pleased with the Son? Well, he's well pleased with the Son. And it goes on to tell us as we, as we look. It gives us a genealogy at that point. And it traces back to Adam. Well, Jesus did what that Adam couldn't do. Because then we have the temptation in the wilderness where Jesus resists temptation. Unlike Adam, Jesus met the conditions. He did what Adam couldn't do, what Israel couldn't do, what David couldn't do. Jesus met the conditions. God's love is given because the conditions were met, right? Uh, so for instance, think of what Jesus says in John fifteen ten. He says, if you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love. Now listen to this. Even as I obey the Father's commandments, and remain in his love. So love is not just this willy-nilly, fiery, do whatever I want, anything goes. Rather, when you truly love something, you love certain design patterns, principles. I love computers. Well, if I love a computer, I, I need to know how it works. I want to study it, its laws, its rules, its codes. To really love that computer means knowing it and, 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 and so forth. I love cooking. Well, what do I do if I love cooking? Well, I study it, right? I study how foods work and how this herb has this effect. Or when I add salt, this happens. I need to know the design pattern, the codes, the rules for how cooking works, right? And so it is with love in the universe and the love of God and God's love for us. You don't divorce it from any concept of, of rules, codes, DNA, what the thing is. You get to know it, right? If I want to know God and love God, I want to know what he's like. What does he value? What is he worth? What is his law, right? What does God say is value, valuable? So there's a sense in which, let me, let me start over at the very beginning of what I said then. Yes, God loves us contra-conditionally. He loves us apart what, from what we have done. But that doesn't remove the law from love. The law still had to be satisfied. And the Lord Jesus Christ did that. And now we're called to follow that law. 
even as the Lord Jesus Christ did, right? As part of loving God and being loved by God. So if I remove law entirely from love, I've got something else, and it's not the love of God. Why is it so important to distinguish different strains of the Bible's teaching on love, the way Don Carson does in his great little book, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God? Yeah, if you've not read D.A. Carson's little book, Difficult Doctrine of Love of God, you really should. Just just to know the territory, the landscape in the Bible of what uh, it says about love. It, it, you know, there's, there's different strains. There's, there's the inner Trinitarian love of the Father for the Son and the Son and Father for the Spirit and so forth. And okay, wh- what is that like? There's God's general love for creation, right? When he says, behold, everything he's created is good. There's, there, there, there's that kind of love. There's a salvific love for he, he, that he has for the whole world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, But then there's also God's particular love for the elect. Think about how he talks to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 7, where he he basically says, I I haven't loved you because you're great or a mighty nation. He, He says, I've loved you because I've loved you. You're mine. You're my bride. Or in Hosea chapter 2, I've, I've betrothed you to me. So that, that this fourth lane is God's love for the elect. I, I love all people, but I love my wife and my kids in a special sort of way. I don't, I don't love all people in the same way I love my wife and my kids. That, that would be weird, right? Something would be wrong with that. And God loves the elect in a special way. So if you want to think about what love is and say, well, I assume God's love is like this. Make sure you're paying attention to all four lanes. Because people talk about God is love. They love the phrase God is love. But very often what they're doing is they're kind of picking either their favorite lane or they're just saying, telling you what they think God is like and what they want love to be. And so when we think about, well, if if God really is loving, surely he wouldn't. Or if God is loving, then surely if two people love each other, no matter what. Hold on. Let's constrain ourselves to the biblical text, look at these four different lanes of how the Bible talks about love, and see if we might not come up with better, both a better theology, but then also a better pastoral practice and, and way of discipleship as we think about what is love. The world today loves love, but I'm not sure the world today really knows what love is. We say God is love, but really very often I think what we mean is love is God, meaning what I think is love is God. So again, I think our churches especially need to constrain themselves to how the Bible talks about love so that we might follow him better. You said in one of your books that the agape conception of love is, quote, fairly mainstream among evangelicals. But you said... Quote, it assumes that God lives and loves ultimately for us. We are his highest love. He loves us more than anything, even his own glory. He idolizes us. What bad fruit grows out of a view like this? Yeah, uh, uh, evangelicals love this idea of agape love, which is gift love, which is unconditional love. And there's true and wonderful things about that that we need to talk about that especially come out of an, an, an Luther's understanding of justification by faith alone and, and sola fide, right? It's not anything I do that causes God to love me. It's, it's, it's what Christ has done which causes God to love me. And that unconditional gift agape love is crucial. We must talk about that. But there's long been this tension among Christians in the relationship between faith and obedience, right? And how do we put these things together? Jesus is my Savior, but for Jesus to be my Savior, does he also have to be my Lord, right? Uh, I'm called to believe, but am I called to repent and believe? Well, I'm going to say yes to all of those. Yes, we're called to repent and believe. Yes, Jesus is Savior and Lord. Yes, love is a gift. It is given contrary to what we deserve. But also love comes with requirements, It comes with demands. I love you. I want what's good for you. I don't want you to follow the way of sin and folly any longer. Romans 6, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, we we, we need to have a better understanding of this relationship between faith and obedience, belief and repentance, love and the call to holiness. Love in the Bible is always holy. It's directed to... or. Love as it should be in the Bible. There's bad loves too. Love as it should be in the Bible is always called to 
holiness, right? So the, 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 the bad fruit that can come to from just a gift view of love only, an agape, as it's defined, view of love only, is kind of an easy believism. It careens towards a sort of universalism, a, a liberal Christianity. Because if I'm defining love entirely in terms of God just loves me no matter what, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, there are no conditions on me after that fact, Jesus, well, well leave Jesus aside, just, God just loves me, it becomes kind of a man-centered view of love. I, I'm the center of the universe. God loves me no matter what, no matter whether or not I believe, no matter whether I trust, no matter whether or not I repent, he just loves me. So, so why not love all humanity into the kingdom, into salvation, whether or not they repent and believe, whether or not they trust in Christ. In other words, a purely gift view of love, I think, and I'm not going to take the time here to kind of trace through how this developed theologically. I think one could, go, moving through Kierkegaard and Nigrid and even Karl Barth and so forth, we, 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 could, we could have that conversation. Uh, it, it leads to a kind of theological liberalism. It leads to a kind of universalism where it's entirely man-centered and where repentance and lordship in the law have been left behind. What is wrong with saying love is a choice, not a feeling? Yeah, there are certain truths that are captured in, in saying love is a choice, not a feeling. So it is part choice. I, I, I don't want to lose that or remove that. But there also is a fiery affection, to use uh, Aquinas's language of, of fire. There is a fiery affection and feeling to it. And I, I think you get that even in Paul. If I speak in the tongue of men of angels, but have not love. If I have the gift of prophecy and fathom all mysteries, but have not love. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, there's a choice, but have not love. I'm choosing to give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames. Well, that's a good thing, right? Well, yes, but I can somehow do that and yet not have love. So finally, I don't think we can get rid of the feelings, thin, shallow word. I'm not crazy about it, but, but I, don't, I don't think we can get rid of the feeling, the desire, the affection, the impulse that are a constituent part of, or yeah, are a constituent part of love as we make godly choices. Absolutely. So in all of this, I'm kind of saying both and. There's a gift, there's a, a self-sacrifice, there's a focus on the other, but there's also an enjoyment. Behold, my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. Right there. I mean, if that's not a picture of love, I don't, that's the father to the son, right? I, I, I think we, we get both in that picture at that moment in Jesus' baptism. Well, and let, let, let me add this. Uh, even in the self-sacrifice, there is a hope of resurrection, so Jesus doesn't sacrifice himself and then is vanquished from the universe. <laughs> you know, and that, that was never the plan. He knew he would rise again. He knew glory would follow. For the joy set before him endured the cross. Right? So even in self-sacrifice, and that is loving, or can be, should be loving, right? Even in self-sacrifice, there's a hope. There's a desire. There's a there's, there's a, I'm reaching for this joy, even at cost to myself right now, right? And I think we see that in creation as parents love their children in that way, right? God has hardwired that lesson into creation, but ultimately it, it, it goes back to him. Discussion of love over time has often shifted, as you show in your work, between viewing love as fundamentally gift and love as fundamentally desire. Who are some of the major figures associated with these views, and how did those views develop over time? You know, uh, Western conceptions of love ironically start not with a Christian philosopher, but with Plato. And Plato talked about eros, and he conceived of love as desire. Love is trying to fill up what we lack. Interestingly, because of that, he said God isn't love, because God doesn't lack anything. Therefore, God must not be able to love, because love is filling up what we lack. Well... Uh, Augustine comes along at this point and he says, well, it's, it's true. That's right. Love is desire, right? I, I agree with Plato, as it were, on that much. But God is love. Because, you know, Pl Augustine's opened his Bible and says God is love. So how, how, do, how do we understand that? Well, it, Augustine used a, a word caritas to sort of combine, you might say, the Latin word caritas to, to combine agape 
and the Greek word agape and, and the Greek word eros, right? And, and those ideas. I mean, he, he wasn't quite doing it with all this language in mind. I'm just giving you the, the, the rundown. And uh, so what Augustine does is says, love involves our desire for for the good of another, but that good is always love of God. So he has these wonderful sentences and paragraphs about if I truly love my wife and my children, I love them with respect to Christ, right? And I love my neighbor, I love my neighbor with respect to Christ. So Augustine understands love as desire, like Plato said, but it's always God-centered. It's always for the good of another in God. So it combines love as gift and love as desire, absolutely. Uh, you see the same thing with Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, Clairvaux. If, if we walk on through that, you see the same sort of thing in Aquinas, uh, this combination of love as desire and love as go- a gift. And you can, you can look through my book and I kind of read, you know, play some of these things out. Now with Luther, it starts to change. I think, I think Luther himself remains fundamentally orthodox in his understanding of love. Uh, but with Luther, you have such an emphasis on sola fide, justification by faith alone, and this, this, this understanding that God loves us contrary to what we deserve. He, he loves us even though we have been sinful. That more and more attention among theologians following that is placed on the gift aspect of love. I think that uh, flowers most uh, explicitly first, perhaps, in um, Kierkegaard, and he makes a distinction between romantic love, desire, and Christian love, which is gift. Notice what he's just done there. Everything that's Christian and good is now under gift, whereas romantic love, I mean, fine, whatever, but it's something different. This is desire and longing and filling of what I lack, whereas Christian love is kind of the gift and, and salvific love and love for the unworthy. Uh, Andres Nygren, a, a Lutheran theologian in the early 20th century, kind of plays out and, and even heightens this distinction between, between uh, desire, romantic love, and Christian gift love. Bart uh, does something similar. Uh, God loves us in freedom. He talks about how it's, it's entirely uh, f- spontaneous, willed by God for us and our, our good, but it's sort of completely divorced from him and his holiness and his glory, the way Bart talks about it. And what this yields ultimately is a, I would say, a, a thin and reductionistic view of love. Now, all the things affirmed by Kierkegaard, not all the things, many of the things affirmed by Kierkegaard and Nigren and Bart in this idea of Christian love, gift love, is good. I don't want to let go of it. But they reduce biblical love to something less than it actually is. I think in the Bible, it always involves desire. And if it's righteous, it's desires for another's good in God. It, let's go back to Augustine. Let's go back to Aquinas and how they talked about it. Uh, and, and I think that's the way we'll discover Jesus talks about love. When he talks about anybody who loves me, he keeps my commandments. Now, wait, wait a second. What, 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 is, what does that have to do with love is gift? If, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you uh, keep my commandments, you will abide in my love even as I love the father, keep the Father's commandments, and abide in His love. What, what does that mean to abide in the Father's love? Well, it's, it's keeping His commandments. Well, the, the, the Christian love of Kierkegaard, Nigren, Bart, doesn't really know what to do with those texts. Again, it's reductionistic. I hear the great American theologian Jonathan Edwards in your work, especially in this key line, Love can involve self-sacrifice, but it's never entirely selfless. You wrote this. To love truly is always to experience some kind of pleasure, even if it's only a few seconds of pleasure before the heart stops and the breath ceases in a last act of loving self-sacrifice. But don't we praise people who do good for others without any thought of reward? I even remember Anakin Skywalker in the first Star, no, the fourth Star Wars movie. You know what I'm talking about. His mom says to somebody, he gives without thought of reward. What's wrong with that? You, you mentioned Edwards. Let me, let me mention Blaise Pascal. He has a famous line about uh, happiness is the motive of every man, even of those who kill themselves. You know, think about the, the person who's hurting themselves, is depressed, who even chooses pain or chooses suicide. Ultimately, why are they doing that? They're seeking happiness. 
You're seeking joy. You, ju- you just can't divorce yourself from that. To be alive is to, in some sense, seek happiness. And true love, self-sacrificial love, doesn't do away with that lesson. It doesn't do away with that reality. So even as I'm, I'm giving of my life for, the, for, for my child, right? I'm, I'm laying down my life for my friend. There is still a, I'm seeking joy in that. I'm seeking happiness in that. Now, in the short term, that might mean I'm extinguished. I'm dead. As Christians, though, we know resurrection is always on the other side of that, right? And I think even the non-Christian who doesn't believe in the resurrection has some intuitive God-designed, God-given sense that this is for good, this is for happiness, this is for joy. I'm going to love that child of mine even unto death, right? There's some inconsistencies in how they think about that. So I think I think love is self-sacrifice is wonderful. I'm, I'm, I don't want to. That's the heart of the gospel, right? But 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 don't remove the resurrection from the other side of the crucifixion, right? For the joy set before him endured the cross, right? And I think love is gift. Love is self-sacrifice. Always involves the hope of an even greater glory. When people walk into church off the cultural street here in the Western world, what do they think love is? I think it's, I think it's crucial for, for pastors and theologians and teachers of the Bible to teach what love is because people walk in off the street, Christians and non-Christians, they walk into the church building on Sunday morning with certain culturally informed views of what love is, right? And it's our job as Bible teachers or preachers or writers to biblicize, reform, reshape their views of love. Okay, what, what is the culture's view of love? Well, it, in many ways, and we could get into the academics of it and go back to the Romantic movement and how, how it was viewed in the Enlightenment and so forth, but let me, let me just fast forward through the sexual revolution. Let me fast forward to right now, to the present, and skip all of that. Love is self-expression. Love is, if you love someone, set them free. Love is heart plus heart equals marriage. Love is self-discovery, self-definition, self-realization, self-actualism, self-expression. If you love me, you will let me be who I am. And I will love you by letting you discover, figure out, define, express who you are, right? And I think that DNA of what love is just goes deep into us as a culture, through, through so many novels and rock songs and movies, Dead Poet Society, uh, you know, all, all kinds of movies we can name, 16 Candles, uh, and so on. It goes deep into, into our cultural DNA that even as Christians, we come into the church building on Sunday morning with these views of love. And so when Jesus says something like, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, we're just like, that just sounds kind of legalistic, Jesus. Jesus is getting a little legalistic there. It's like, really? You're going to tell Jesus what love is? You know? Uh, so... Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think we as, as teachers of the Bible and as Bible readers need to look at the whole of Scripture and say, what exactly is love? Can I say one more thing? You know, let, let, you know, go back to the 19th century romantic, capital R, romance movement novels and sometimes non-romantic novels. But think of, think of say, Pride and Prejudice, right, or, or Jane Eyre. What you have in the 19th century, century is this explosion of, of novels about... Uh, she loves him and he loves her, but they're separated by class, but they, they, they recognize each other. Each discovers uh, somehow you, let me use a modern term, complete me, right? And therefore, I know I need to throw off all class structures and maybe you start getting into the work of, say, D.H. Lawrence and others, throw off religious structures, throw off morality structures, throw off what mom and dad wanted me and expected me, because in her or in him, I find the completion of myself. And there is true love. Never mind the church, never mind grandpa, never mind tradition, never mind all of this. Love is the universe of myself connecting with this other self. And you take those romance movie mo- novels and you kind of fast forward through the sexual revolution. You fast forward into television and movies and rock songs. And that's what you have in love today, right? Love is me throwing off the universe, knowing myself, and finding another person who completes me. It's, it's chaotic, finally, right? It's, it's finally, I am God. And I am love, not God is love.
I hope you can see the gold that Lehman just mined for you from the pages of Scripture. If love is the most important commandment, and the second most important commandment, love God and love neighbor, surely it's important not to confuse or obscure what the Bible says about love. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, Bible Study Magazine is no more. Lehman's insights were featured in our final issue. Also, however, check out my interview, my video interview with linguist Vern Poitras here on the Logos YouTube channel. But the kinds of Bible-centered Bible study resources that Bible Study Magazine was known for can now be found in even greater abundance at the Word by Word blog, logos.com slash grow. We at Logos Bible Software are still very much committed to using technology to equip the church to grow in the light of the Bible. We want to help people who are interested in growing their knowledge of Scripture and their skill in studying it. I personally took great delight in editing Bible Study Magazine for the last about two years of its existence. And my mission, like that of the magazine and Logos, is still to help people study the Bible with the best tools. Therefore, I encourage you also to check out Logos, my favorite daily tool for Bible study. Just go to logos.com slash basic to get the free version of our software. That's logos.com slash basic.